guys! Today I wanted to talk to you about watercolor brushes. This is a topic I think everybody can use some help with and um, I've been watercoloring for the past six, seven years regularly while I work on 7 inch Kara, so I've learned a lot. Something you need to keep in mind is I am not what most people would consider a traditional watercolorist. I have zero interest in watercolor as fine art. It doesn't mean I don't believe it should be fine art or that it is fine art. It means that I am a watercolor comic artist and unfortunately the fine art community doesn't really consider comics to be fine art and many watercolorists do not look kindly upon watercolor comics. I have before you a spread of some of my favorite brushes and today I'm going to explain to you how I use them and where you can find them but first I want to show you a sample of my work. So here are some recent examples of my work. Here are some completed pages from my ongoing comic, 7-inch Kara. It's a watercolor, all-ages comic about a Lilliputian girl who's 7 inches tall who meets a human girl for the first time, and it's entirely in watercolor. And I'm painting this on Canson Montval paper, which is not considered a fine art paper. It is affordable, it does go through my printer, so I can sustainably paint these pages. So when you take my, when and if you take my advice on brushes, you need to keep in mind that this is the sort of work I'm creating these sort of illustrations. I feel really passionately that art should be for the masses and I am really invested in making art and art education something for everyone to be able to enjoy. Of course, that doesn't mean I don't use watercolors in a more fine art application. Even though I paint watercolor comics, I think it's important to hone your skills by doing watercolor studies. So I often work from photos or from life. Even to the point of being as realistic as possible. And I use the same brushes for my comics as I do for um, these sort of more rendered, more fine art illustrations. And these are just studies that I did based on micro fashion photography uh, to try and develop skills and to enhance familiarity with my brushes and with my paints. So while not all of them ended up perfect, I enjoyed doing them and I learned a lot from them. And if you see something you like, please keep in mind that not only do I sell comics, I also offer realistic portrait commissions. So please check out my website or email me if you're interested in that. So now that you guys have a better understanding of how I use watercolors, let me go ahead and go through some of my favorite brushes. Now, I used to live really close to a Dick Blick, so I would buy a lot of Winsor & Newton brushes, a lot of Blick um, in conjunction with, like Blick Studio in conjunction with Winsor & Newton brushes, um, a Skoda brushes, really nice watercolor brushes. Now, I live in Nashville, and uh, there's no Dick Blick. Uh, we do have a Jerry's. Their brush selection is kind of limited, but I have found some, some treasures in that, too. So, um, my recommendations kind of span the board. Um, from everything from synthetics to natural hair brushes. So I'm going to start with how I start my watercolors with mops. And if you're a watercolor artist, you really don't need to spend a lot of money on your mops. These are two Cotman mops. You really only need one. I use the 5 8 brush for years and years and I only recently bought a larger brush because I've been working on larger pieces but if you're working at a, a size of say um, 10 by 14 or 11 by 15 the smaller one should work just fine and this is in synthetic hair brush um, it's very soft you do need to clean it occasionally and I can talk to you guys about that a little later on in the video as well um, and I think I paid like $14 for it and it's just lasted and lasted some other synthetic mops or um, large application brushes I enjoy um, is this Filbert, this large Filbert. It's a synthetic. I got this from Jerry's. It's a Mimic as well as this other Mimic. Um, 
it is a 26 round. So something you need to consider is that for the larger brushes, many of us can only afford to buy synthetics and synthetics are often not really the best choice. Um, you're not going to necessarily get really sharp, crisp brush strokes. You're not necessarily going to get the sort of water retention in a synthetic brush that you would in a natural brush but they're a lot more affordable. So if you're learning or if you're broke or if you're just getting started, it's okay to have several synthetics in your collection. Some other synthetics I have are this Cotman Cat's Tongue, and this one's actually getting a little bit beaten up. I've had it for several years. It's seen a lot of abuse. Um, as well as this Cotman Flat. I found that with flats, I don't really need to own natural hair brushes for flats. Synthetic is just fine. Um, Utrecht also makes some synthetics that also have some red sable in them, so they're not entirely synthetic. Now, with your synthetics, you do need to wash them. I like to use Old Master's brush soap, but you don't need to condition them the way you would natural hair brushes. So you have um, several options for natural hair brushes. I prefer to use squirrel hair like um, these Creative Mark and Blick Master Brushes. Um, I have found that the Blick Master Brush, while more expensive than the Creative Mark brush, has held up better um, and it performs better. And if I had access to a Blick again, I would own a lot more of these. Um, all I have access to right now are the Creative Mark brushes, so that's what I replaced it with. Oh, and um, something else, I've mentioned this a few times, if you have cats and you leave your brushes unattended, they will eat your brushes. Another thing is um, if somebody has a, uh, a moth problem in their apartment and they dump a bunch of their moth-eaten clothes on you, possibly without your permission, those moths will eat your brushes as well. So you need to protect these brushes. Now, um, I have used Series 7 brushes in the past. Ah, and in a minute, I'll grab one if I can find it. I keep it under lock and key because my cat is kind of a destructive boy cat. And um, he will ruin it if it's left within his reach. Here we go. And this is a larger Series 7. It's sort of my pride and joy and doesn't get used very often at all. And it's a size 5. And with Series 7 by Winsor Newton, the larger brushes get really, really expensive. So if you're looking to save some money and not lose too much to quality, and you have a Jerry's Artorama nearby, I recommend you actually go for their Creative Mark Rhapsody brushes, which are made of Kolinsky Sable, the same as the Series 7 brushes. Now, I mean, Series, Winsor Newton makes a really big deal about how the Series 7 brushes are made by hand, on and on, yada, 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 but, you know, that's, that's great and all, but if your cat's gonna ruin your brushes anyway, or if moths are gonna ruin your brushes anyway, or your, your younger brother or your older sister or your mom or your dad are gonna end up messing with your brushes anyway, I don't know, to touch up the paint on the wall or for a class project, whatever. If, <laughs> if you can't entirely control all aspects of your studio, the Rhapsody brushes are great. They cost a lot less than the Series 7, although many of you may still find them very expensive. They come in similar sizes, and the only real difference that might make a difference for you is that they are a lot shorter. The, like the brush, the bristles, the hairs rather, are a lot shorter than the Series 7. I actually really like that because there's more snap and I can better control the brushes. But if you don't like that, um, you should probably Probably when you have the money test around and find something that works better for you now natural hair brushes have something called a belly and I'm gonna hold a synthetic this is a mimic synthetic next to a creative mark Rhapsody um, this is a six and this is a four they're basically the same size though because that synthetic brush has no belly and the belly is the widest part where the the bristle sort of 
bell out and that's the part that holds your water it holds your pigment so this will actually drip drop all over your paper if you've got too much water in your brush whereas this will not so that is where you might really prefer your natural brushes and that doesn't mean there isn't a place for synthetics in your studios I use synthetics um, to mix my pigments because they're a little bit stiffer and I'm not afraid of ruining my synthetic brushes I use synthetics like this Dura handle creative inspiration when I'm using opaque white because opaque white or white gouache tends to be very stiff even when you add water it's very hard to control but a synthetic brush with a stiffer um, with a stiffer bristle will do a lot better at controlling it. Now, um, brushes can come in a variety of lengths. Here are some long handle brushes. Um, these are great if you work further away from your painting, um, if you work on larger pieces. I don't use these too often. I don't really care for them. I like short handle brushes, as you can see, because I tend to get like real up close and personal with everything I paint. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the anatomy in a watercolor brush, it's pretty simple. You've got your handle. Most of them have wooden handles. A few of them have plastic handles. You've got your metal ferrule. You've got the crimping. You've got the bristles. You've got the belly on the bristles. So something you should never, ever, ever do, and I will smack you if I catch you doing it. You would smack you too when you know. Do not leave your watercolor brushes standing in water. You are not four years old. <laughs> you will ruin your nice brushes. It will crack the paint, the lacquer on your handle. It will make the bristles within the ferrule come loose because it'll dissolve the glue. It will wreck your nice brushes. Do not do it. If you're having trouble cleaning your brushes and you don't have brush soap, you can use a mild baby shampoo and sort of work it in. And then afterwards, if you're using natural hair fibers, you can use a little bit of inexpensive uh, conditioner to sort of um, feed the hair. I know, I know the hair is dead. I know it's not actually eating. But to sort of recondition, to put oils back onto the hair. And make sure you wash that conditioner out um, when not in use. So... Um, these here are rounds. Rounds are what I use almost entirely in my studio, very common in my studio. They do get more expensive as they get larger. Um, I recommend you paint with the biggest brush you can for the area you're covering. Artists who end up with muddy, muddy over-rendered pieces, they tend to start too small. Please don't use something this little. This is a number one. Please don't use something this little to paint a background. This should be used for details. It should be used for drawing hair, for adding highlights, not for, not for painting an entire background. You want to paint an entire background, use something like this. Use the biggest brush you can. So, um, if you guys have any questions, if you'd like to see anything specific demonstrated, or if you need any sort of help, please leave a comment below. Um, I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope it at least taught you enough to know what questions to ask. Because when I first started watercoloring, I didn't know anything at all. And I highly recommend you watch through, Dick Blick has a bunch of videos, Jerry's Artorama does too. You can look them up on, on YouTube. They have a lot of educational videos that demonstrate their products so you can learn about the product before you've purchased it, which can save you a lot of money if you're just learning a medium. So I highly recommend you check those out. And if you have specific questions, especially if you're an illustrator or a comic artist who wants to get into watercolor, please let me know. I will try to help you as much as possible. We kind of tend to be in the minority. There are many comic artists who do use watercolor, but it's more for washes than like, you know, actual rendering with watercolor. So I would love to help out, support any of my fellow artists who have a similar goal to me. Let's break into that industry together. Let's change some minds. Um, if you would like to help support me, if you appreciate what I do, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can get a copy of 7-Inch Care, that watercolor comic I just showed you and can show you again. You can get 
your very own copy of volume one from my online store, natasoup.com slash kara-comic. Now, the comic is $15 plus shipping. It's beautiful. It is my life's work. I love it. And it would really mean a lot to me if you checked it out. You also get a super cute wooden charm. Um, so it's really, in my opinion, not only, I mean, of course it's my comic, so I'm, I'm very biased, but it's kind of a good deal too. Like, I'm not just trying to take your money. I really just want to get this thing that I love that I've worked so hard on into people's hands. Another way you can really help me out is by sharing this video to your social networks, letting other artists know what you found helpful, what you found useful, and helping me build up my audience. That would be huge for me. I would really appreciate it. Another way you can help out is by um, providing a little funding via my Patreon. My Patreon is patreon.com slash natosoup, and I pretty much use all of the proceeds from that to make more content like this. This sort of stuff takes a long time to do. So um, I hope you guys had a great day. I really appreciate you watching this video. I hope I was able to teach you a couple of basic things about what watercolor brushes so we can start having some larger dialogues about watercolor brushes, learn more together. I'm Becca Hilburn from Natto Soup Studio. I hope you guys have a great day. Goodbye!